Big Podcast. It's Build a Big Podcast, the marketing podcast for podcasters. David Hooper with you. Bigpodcast.com is the website. On this episode, we're talking about books. Me and Joe Saul Sehi from Stacking Benjamins Podcast. I've got a new book out. He's got a new book out. We did things a little bit differently. I self-published. I talk about why I self-published. He went with a major publishing house. One of the reasons that he did that, six-figure deal. Before one copy is sold, he's already making money, and he's got some good people on his team. We're going to go into that. If you're wondering what comes first, the book or the podcast, eh, different things for different people. But for Joe, that podcast 100% helped him to get the book deal that he wanted, and we go into that. We talk about finding and working with a co-author, getting the agent that can get you the deal. Also, what I call the secondary payoff to doing a book. If you're a podcaster and you're doing a lot of interviews, there's a very specific way that a book will help you. We go into that. Speaking of interviews, one of the ways that Joe grew his podcast was great interviews. The problem for podcasters is the best people to interview are not the most technically advanced. They've got good thoughts. They can communicate their thoughts in a certain way, but they're book authors, they're speakers. They're not people that are used to doing their own tech. Because of the pandemic, we're not able to get in the same room like we used to. Put a mic in front of somebody, be just a few feet away. It's just not happening right now. Thankfully, there's Riverside. It's used by over 70,000 people and companies ranging from individual creators, people like Guy Raz, Gary Vee, to companies like Spotify and the New York Times. It records locally on each end, meaning your side of the interview is on your computer. The guest side of the interview, that's recorded locally too. Then those two computers get together, upload their individual tracks, and you've got an interview that sounds like the person was literally in the same room with you. It is very high quality and it's easy to do. Even if you've got a guest who's a non-techie, all you need to do is get that guest a link. The guest clicks on it just like a web page. It opens up the Riverside Studio in Chrome. No additional software to get. It's just like a web page. You are connected, recording the guest in, recording your end, mashing it up into a great sounding interview. You're going to sound like a pro, just like Joe and I do. If it sounds good, you're interested in checking it out, I've got a free trial for you. Visit riverside.fm and use the code BIGPODCAST, B-I-G-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. If you decide to stick it out, you'll get 15% off any membership plan. Go there right now before you forget, riverside.fm. It's going to make getting these great interviews on tape so easy for you, so easy for your guest. And with that, Let's get into a great interview. This is me with Joe Saul Sehi talking about his six-figure book advance and how this deal came together. Let's talk about how the book came about because when you have a large audience, something that podcasters may or may not understand, depending, is that opportunities come your way because they think, oh, this guy's got a podcast. He's got a big audience. We can sell that audience stuff. And a book is one of those things. Is that what happened to you or did you go after the book yourself? I did. I had written a book originally. It had taken me 10 years. I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was waiting until the platform got big enough where I would get that respect that you're talking about. I got to the point where we had crested 30,000 listeners a show. And I thought, okay, this is probably enough that I could probably do a book deal. And I really, you know, my purpose for the book, number one was because I interview so many people in this space you see where the cracks are and what you're not getting. There wasn't a book that was written that was technically proficient, but can't be like our show. That was this real on-ramp wide guide. So, you know, the pitch that we had, by the way, was this book, and this truly is what this book is. It is, I took the Hardy Boys detective manual <laughs> and, and I combined it with the Cub Scout Wolf Guide and made it about money for adults. So yeah, that was, I'm in. Yeah, that was, that was what stacked was your super serious guide to money. But I'll tell you what happened. The first thing is that book that I'd written over 10 years was awful. I give it to my wife, Cheryl, and she gave it back to me like 18 minutes later and goes, this sucks <laughs> because it was much more of a Dave Ramsey thing. It wasn't the on-ramp that our show was. It's where you were. Yeah. It definitely did not have the same feeling as what Stacky Benjamins is and what I really enjoy doing. So that was number one. And then I realized the next book was probably going to take 10 years as, as well, which I did not want to go through that. I was actually reading somebody else's book and in the back in that epilogue where they talk about thanking people in the making of it. This woman said that she had had a book deal for two years and her editors kept calling her saying, where's the book? Where's the book? Where's the book? And she's like, and then I realized that I worked at Vice, the big online publication, and she's surrounded by all these great writers. So she found a co-author and I went, wow, oh man, I love collaborating. 
I think right. it would be better, you know, Sun Tzu, the art of war says the best battle is the one that's never fought. And a battle I knew I was going to have to fight was that it was my first thing. So if I could find somebody that's already written a bunch of hit personal finance books and I partner with them, then that's great. Found my friend, Emily Guy Birkin. She's got four other books that are all by major publishers. And I told her, I want to make this, you know, Hardy Boys Detective Manual and Cub Scout Wolf Guide. And she's like, I never get to do comedy, you know, and she's very proficient. She knows her stuff. Emily signed on. And then I did the same trick with our guests. I found our guests that I really liked that it had been through a major publisher and I asked them if I could be introduced to their agent. And so a woman named Kristen Wong, who's a great writer in our community, Farnoosh Tarabi. Farnoosh has a great show called So Money. That's a big show in our space. And then Gene Chatsky from the Today Show. They all graciously introduced us to their agents. We interviewed all three and they interviewed us, right? It was a two-way street. But Gene Chatsky's agent from the Today Show, we talked to that woman. You know, all these meetings were supposed to be 15 minutes. We talked to her for like an hour and 15 minutes. You have to have somebody that you like because you're like, working I knew, so closely I just and you've got to trust them. She was just great. Oh, she was fabulous. She was amazing. What I also liked was I am one of the few men in her stable and we're also one of only three financial writers she works with. So, you know, some of the other agents out there work with a ton of other financial writers and I didn't really want that. I wanted it to be unique. And certainly the other two financial writers, Gene Chatsky and Tiffany Aliche, the budget Nista, who also has a big book out now. Tiffany definitely works from a strong black woman's point of view Jean's whole brand is her money. So then you've got Joe, who's just a wide audience dude doing something totally different. So I like the fact that we were going to be unique in her stable. And then she took the book. We went on a book tour with publishers during COVID where we told that same story about Cub Scout Wolf Guide and Hardy Boys Detective. Let Manual. me jump in there because you know how, remember Miami Vice? Yeah, yes. The yes. pitch for Miami Vice was MTV Cops. Oh, was it really? The simpler you can keep your pitch, the better. And I know exactly what you're talking about, having been a Cub Scout. It's just like a simple manual. It's a very beginner yeah, beginner guide. And then you've got a mystery that needs to be solved right, right. in an entertaining way, perhaps. <laughs> right. That's such a great pitch. People try to make these things. Uh, when we go back to playing your game, uh, you know, do your thing, man. I mean, but don't call it the Uber of something or... The Netflix. Yeah, right. <laughs> Have a unique way of, of saying that maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So that's how the book came about. I was pleased that because I had the right people on my team, again, going back to that day that I was crying about money and I needed to upgrade my team because I had the right people on my team, the right co-author yes. that got the agent because I had the good agent. Then that got us the six figure book deal. That's amazing. And did you look at any publisher or because they're independent, there's major houses. How did you end up with Avery? Avery, you know, is an imprint of Penguin Random House. And it's funny because a lot of my friends are on Wiley. Oh yeah. Big business publisher. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of financial books there. And I said to Heather, I said, Hey, I'm not seeing on this list that you're sending out. Uh, I'm not seeing Wiley. And a lot of my <laughs> friends are on Wiley and she goes, cause we're going big. Cause we're going with the biggest. <laughs> and actually what was cool is, you know, there's the big five yeah. and we only had five houses bid on this book and they were the big five. Yeah. The big five bit on the book. And our editor, our editor is the same editor that edited Atomic Habits for uh, uh, James huge. Clear. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, yes. that's one of the bigger nonfiction books in the last 10 years, probably. Just huge. And it's great to brag about, but when you're in meetings with Nina and our team, you feel like the younger brother who has the hit, you know, the stud older brother. Cause I was like, James, James is so great. James is so awesome. Well, it really is cool to have a good team. And, and it sounds like that's how you built this thing. You had momentum, you had an audience, you were seated in yourself. Because people always ask, like, how do you get a book deal? Just strange enough, I, I had one a long time ago, the very first book I was going to do 10 years ago, Music Business Guide, with not the dummies, but the idiots guide. The, the idiots one. guide. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And it, was, it was so frustrating to me. I walked away from it. I've self published ever since, <laughs> but it can work for some people. And if you're at the level that you're at, that's when it works for you. You can only take an independently published book so far. Now, these days, distribution is not an issue, but this 40 City Tour actually hit in New York Times, if that's your goal. Is that your goal? Uh, uh, it was until I realized how that game really works. And I didn't realize how unprepared we were for that game. 
Yeah. So, so, so the answer is yes, but kind of like anything, I've learned so much about podcasting from podcasting. I've learned so much about how books work by writing a book. So the answer is heck yeah. I mean, that's great. I want to write a book that I'd be proud of. I'd love it to be on the charts. That'd be great. But in personal finance, if you look at the personal finance charts, 95% of those books are 10 years old. Yeah, Books have to get legs in my area. Maybe you'll hit it right out of the gate if you're already a big name, which you know, in, in my little world, we're a big name, but on the big stage, we're nobody. I mean, we are absolutely nobody. Well, I would rather have a perennial hit if you will, either through music, speaking of wedding DJs, I mean, you and I were probably DJing 10 years apart, but we are still playing the same songs. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> hey, can you play Dancing Queen? Yeah, we got it. Yeah, oh, we got it. Yeah. I just yes. got one CD I press play on and it's good. But, you know, it, it's one of those kind of things. Like if, if you can get to that level, I actually know Dave Ramsey's agent who got him the first deal. And she told me, she goes, that thing's the gift that keeps on giving. Sure. And yes. this is 30 years later. I mean, she's doing very well just based on that one book. And I'm sure she's got other books that she's worked with too. But if you can do that, you may not hit the charts, but in the end, you're going to sell more than if you hit it and then just dumped it, which is what I think a lot of people do. But that's kind of like chasing the listeners and podcasting. I'll tell you what the big thing has been for me that has been great, which is our audience knows me as the host of the show. And I'm usually not trying to be an expert. This book gave me the opportunity to show that I am also a thought leader. I was going to ask you about that because as somebody who interviews other people for my broadcast show, I was always having people come up to me. Oh man, you're a great DJ. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm a marketing guy. I'm working with these people. But it is one of those things like it can get lost if you have co-hosts and it can get lost if you're interviewing people, but this is the opportunity to do it. Talk about that because that's going to change a lot of things for the show going forward, I would imagine. It already has. You can already see it. It is weird because I'm the same guy that I've always been. Yeah, doing but, the same stuff. <laughs> yes. And everybody everybody told me ahead of time, David, that I was going to be treated differently when I wrote a book. And it is totally true. It is completely true. I mean, on one hand, it's frustrating because I know there's a lot of people out there that have a lot of great opinions. But when you put author in front of it, for whatever reason, people turn their head where they 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 didn't do that before. You know what I think it is? I think it's because of the media authors get. If you think about Oprah, Larry King, the bigger sure. shows that we've had, author, movie maker, actor, musician, you're right up there. And even though most people don't read books, we still look at it as something that's an accomplishment. And it is, you know, this, cause it took you 10 years to write that first one and yeah. it, yeah. it ain't yeah. easy. Yeah. No, it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> But to your point, I realized why people like David Bach in our area, the the, the automatic millionaire yeah. guy, yep. why he writes a new book every three years. It's it's the way to stay in people's consciousness. Yeah. And and it has been great for the show. I met a guy last night in New York City who told me that he had never yet listened to our podcast. He bought the book. After he heard me on WNYC, the only reason I was on WNYC was because I had written the book. That They had me on answering listener questions. Right. I answered his question. Then he reached out on Twitter and he said, I was a nice guy. He looked through my Twitter feed. I was a nice guy. And he came to the book signing and he goes, and now I can't wait to dive into your podcast. Well, that's how you know that you've done something that's beyond what you thought was important. That's almost like- So cool. Paul McCartney does a duet with Pitbull or something like, oh man- <laughs> <laughs> they should really thank Pitbull for helping this Paul McCartney guy out. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, that McCart- I don't know who that McCartney is, but man. Yeah. He might have an opportunity now. Yeah. <laughs> but but it, that I think that's awesome. I love it. My friend uh, Derek Silvers from CD Baby. Well, I know him from mm-hmm. CD Baby. This is funny because he says people run into him all the time. He said, after CD Baby, oh, what are people going to know me for now? And these days, if you say Derek Sivers, oh, I know TED Talk. I know the books. I know the other stuff that yeah. he's doing. They're like, they don't know what he did beforehand. So that's super exciting. Are you going to do another one? Are you already working on that? So the answer was no. Was no. Yeah, this is my first and last book. But now, <laughs> once again, now that I've written a book and I see then from writing the book how the game's played, I think if I'm in this space, Tom Webster said this once, everything is kind of coming together. And if your goal is to find your audience, it's no longer about just audio. It's audio, video, writing. It's wherever people are. So the goal is you know, to become good at podcasting. I had to get rid of everything else. But now that we've grown the audience, I can then reinvest that in a good team 
team, which allows me now to go back in a bigger way in these areas that I couldn't do before. And I think that writing a book, the act of writing it myself, by the way, I think was really important because, you know, you talked about being grounded and finding your audience. And I think because I talk to authors all the time, I think the act of me writing it versus finding a ghost you oh, know, yeah. writer is huge. I think, yep. I think I will definitely the next one I will write. And I already have another idea for it. Oh, and, and let's be clear. This is a co-written book, not a ghost written book. It is not a ghostwritten book. Emily's name is right next to mine. You did write it. You just wrote it with somebody else. Yeah, I wrote half the book. She wrote half the book. And then we gave each other's the chapters, uh, each other's chapters. And then we rewrote and edited each other's chapters to make the voice unified. And uh, a lot of people have told us they can't tell who's written what chapter, which is great. That's good. And the cool thing too, when I had a co-writer, it really helped where that first book took 10 years. This one really took about, the first draft took about four months. Wow. And it, and it was because of the fact that we stayed on task because I had somebody who's holding my hand. And also we did something different than a lot of people do. Most people write the book and they try to sell it. I had an idea and I took that to the agent. And then the agent took the idea and then we wrote the book. We already had the deal before we wrote the book. Yeah, that helps. I mean, I think the pressure, well, it can also be crushing. So it, I can't say it, it always helps. But, you know, I think the podcasting skills that we've developed as podcasters, though, that helps writing too, because of the organization that you do, just like public speaking, I feel like there's a, a circular thing, public speaking, blog posts, writing books, podcasting, interviews, all of these things come together and you start to see the parallels and pattern match. That's something that I imagine is easier now than it would have been 10 years ago. Not only do you know who you are, you've developed these skills that you didn't even know you were developing. I think the interviews, especially like doing interviews, you and I've been doing interviews long enough that we know the narrative and the fact that this is, this needs to have a story arc, right? And I want to lead my interviewee down this story arc so that my audience gets this really nice, warm, fuzzy from it. I get to read a lot of books because I prep for those interviews and then I get to try to organize that interview well. So when I sat down to write the book, like how the book was structured was a really important part of it. Big time. That's going to help your speed just for the record that if you know Absolutely. what you're getting into. Yeah. Because what you're getting into never is really what you're getting into, but <laughs> <laughs> you know this, <laughs> but have some kind of idea of what you think you're getting into. And I'm laughing because uh, so we get, you know, you know, we get the deal to write the book and it, and, and it's 85,000 words. And our first draft was 120. Dude, I'm, words. I'm right there with you. That's <laughs> yes. I did the same thing in my last book. <laughs> and then, and then we're like George R.R. R. Martin with Game of Thrones where we're killing everybody. <laughs> with, you know, a third of our book was the red wedding. It just, it was just gone. <laughs> well, yeah. there's editing skills for your podcast though, right? That's it's the skills true. that you develop. What's important and what's not. What's really, or like comedy is perfect for that. Somebody like Paul Ollinger, sometimes they'll give him five minutes. You know, he's got to cut that 10 minute set down. If he goes on the Tonight Show, that's what they're going to give him. They're not giving him as much as he wants. They're giving him five minutes. Pick the best four. Yeah. 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 And it's funny. Somebody asked me that last night. They said, oh, because we told that story about 120,000 words. And uh, somebody said, ooh, what was something that was in the book that you wish you could have kept in? And you know what's funny, David? I can't think of anything. Yeah. Like, cause now it's tight and I seriously don't remember what we cut. So clearly, uh, I think we cut the right. We well, got remnants for the next one. Right. My new book, <laughs> it started as remnants from the last one. Cause I thought this is a nice idea, but it's not fleshed out and it just doesn't, it doesn't fit the, I mean, it's not that it was bad. It just didn't fit what it was. And I think that's one of those skills that I've developed, even with an interview, you know, it's like, Sure. It's cool. Maybe it's a bonus thing. Speaking of that, by the way, this was neat. And, and also back to a little bit of stealing like an artist, something else, because I really did want to fuse this into the podcast. So the podcast helps the book. The book helps the podcast. And I was in a bookstore on Amelia Island and I'm uh, looking around and I saw this book by Howard Stern and all it was, was Howard Stern's interviews, interviews. with, <laughs> yes, Howard yeah. Stern didn't do anything. Somebody no. just, just wrote out the interviews. Yep. But it was really cool. And so at the end of every chapter of Stacked, we took an interview from the show, an expert talking about the thing that Emily and I had just discussed. And we have all these different experts, these transcripts of interviews all the way through the book. 
in the audiobook, they actually play snippets of the podcast. I was going to ask you that because I've seen Can't Hurt Me, that book, where they've done things in a different way where the author doesn't read it, but he'll come in and do interviews. I've seen things like the Stern book. I'm getting ready to do something very similar in my audio book. So that's awesome. You own the content. You made sure that you were setting yourself up to do that later. That's another important lesson for podcasters. Well, no, I didn't. Whoa. I didn't. Okay. I had Next time. I, well, no, no, no. Let me tell you, I had to go back and send all these people a release form. Right. You had to say, hey, uh, do you guys mind? And, and and by the way, and then and then you got to get creative and you just say, hey, good news. I got a book deal and I want you to be in my book, but you can only be in my book if you sign this release. Yeah. Yeah. Because the publisher, it wasn't you probably, it's the big publisher. They're going to make sure they're taken care of. Sure. But I definitely, I mean, you know, between you and I and the, and, 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 and the, and the people listening, you know, I'm nervous that they're going to go, yeah, no, I don't think so. But, but I really tried to play to their ego. Go listen. I got this book deal with a really big yeah. book. A lot of people are going to read. It's your how name. you pitch it's Hardy boys and, and wolf cub manual. Oh, that so. was totally, it was, it, it was totally, I felt like I had smoke mirrors, dogs, and ponies, like all the, <laughs> all the above. Rainbow and a unicorn. Here we go, right. baby. Yeah. No, you got, well, people like the opportunity. I'm, I'm thinking about that though with the next one. It's like, how am I going to pitch that? Because basically I'm having people produce episodes that I can use as examples. Sure. And a lot of people, that's how you tell the difference between a pro though and an amateur, I think, is I think the pro is playing chess and sees the opportunity and you're thinking that longer game rather than just like you guys changing your show. Like sure. we're going to do something that loses people or it's going to be for free now, but it's going to boom, come back. Just like that wind power that you've got. <laughs> so if you want the example of the audiobook and the book, by the way, it's stacked your super serious guide to modern money management with Emily Guy Birkin. Audible.com has it. That's probably the best place to get it. Amazon, wherever you get your books. And I'll tell you that the audiobook, uh, the woman who plays my mom, <laughs> does the parts of my mom uh, in the audiobook you hear the actual interviews which are neat emily opens up every chapter which is an achievement right every chapter in our book is an achievement and there's a place for your mom to sign at the end of every chapter that you completed it and you get your badge Love so <laughs> uh yeah yeah but the audiobook is really fun because you get the different voices as well see i, I love that too and i think for a, an author, we talked about personality. You've got to voice your own audiobook if you're a podcaster. You have to. And I've done them both ways. I've produced several audiobooks for other people and my own books. I'm always going to voice. I'm actually in the middle of voicing one now. It is difficult, difficult, difficult. It's so hard. Oh, man. I, I'm, I'm glad you said that. Yes. I thought this is going to be a breeze because you and I talk all the time. Yep. No, it is not a breeze. Well, you know what I do because I'm so used to looking at a whatever you give me and basically vamping off of it, making up my own stuff. I have a hard time sticking to the script, even if it's a paragraph. Right. <laughs> so. And apparently, apparently I, per I pronounced some words incorrectly. I learned too, because the director made me say them about 16 times. It's stressful. Yeah. I found I overdo the energy too, where I'll be breathing differently and I'll lose my voice. I've got to ease into it, but that's one of the reasons why I practice reading every day. And that's something to think about for podcasters, practice, practice, practice that reading. So when it does come up, cause it will either for your book or somebody else do it, but man, this has been fantastic. I know you're uh, Baltimore tonight on to the next adventure. I can't wait to see you in Nashville, man. We'll make Nashville happen with you. Let's do it. Thank you. That was Joe Saul see and build a big podcast. What a great story. I can tell you firsthand as an author myself, it's not easy to sell books. And Joe going on this 40 city tour, that's a great way to kick it off. He didn't even pay for it. The tour was paid for. This is the power of a big podcast. He's got this big book deal, six figure advance. He's got the tour paid for. That's what happens when you've got a lot of people listening to you. People come to you, start throwing money at you. <laughs> that interview, by the way, on the road, from Joe's hotel room. I'm going to be back on a future episode to talk more about the behind the scenes of this interview and the other interviews that I've done. I've done hundreds of them. It's a great way to grow your podcast, but there are some things you're going to want to be aware of if you're doing interviews. Just little things, things I've picked up along the way, things that are make getting that interview so much easier for you. One of those things, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, Riverside FM, riverside.fm is the URL. It makes remote interviews like this a breeze. Visit Riverside.fm and use the code BIGPODCAST, B-I-G-P-O-D-C-A-S-T, Big Podcast, all one word. You'll get 15% off. Do go get that free trial. I think you're going to really like it, Riverside.fm. And if you want that behind-the-scenes episode that I'm talking about, 
bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. That is how to subscribe to the podcast. It's completely free. You'll get every episode that I do delivered to your iPhone, to your Android device, wherever you get your podcast. I'm going to get it to you free. You can unsubscribe at any time. When you go to bigpodcast.com slash subscribe, you will see three buttons, one for iPhone, one for Android, one for the RSS feed. Click on the one that you need and I will get you those episodes as soon as they are delivered. bigpodcast.com slash subscribe. Thanks for listening. And back to my book real quick, 101 Podcast Episode Templates. Thanks for supporting that. It's been out about a month. It's been going great. One of the top podcasting books on Amazon, if you haven't already gotten it, 101 Podcast Episode Templates. Look it up on Amazon. It's 99 cents on Kindle right now. Super easy read. It's gonna help you to come up with great podcast episode ideas where you're doing something solo or you're doing something like I just did, interviewing other great guests. Get it before the price goes up. It's amazon.com. Just search for 101 podcast episode templates. Thanks again for listening. And I'll see you on the next episode of Build a Big Podcast.